So as somebody from the U.S., I, I have to be a little humble here speaking about urbanism in Europe. Um, we obviously spent the last half of the 20th century destroying urbanism. And as Paul Moran pointed out, um, it's a pretty dreadful process that we engaged in. And, we, uh, and, and of course, Europeans and Asians that are, that are here in the audience you were sort of weaned on urbanism. This is second nature to you. We're just relearning how to do this, actually over the last 15 to 20 years. So we have a lot to learn. And then of course, as, as Chuck mentioned, I'm also a, a real estate developer. So I'd like to ask how many here in the audience are either a private developer or somebody that works with private developers primarily? Hmm, more than I thought. So about 20% of us here. So I'm not the deeply demented minority that I thought I was. <laughs> um, it's, it's critical that the, that the developers be here because all the research shows that great walkable urban places for every $1 of public money, it's 10 to $15 of private money. You've got to make these places work economically if, in fact, you want them to work on the ground. So I want to talk about the future the future of our metropolitan areas, the future of, of our cities in North America, as we shift from what I refer to as drivable suburban back to walkable urban. And it really comes down to place management, place making and place management. And it really is a missing level of governance in our society. It's, a, it, it's something that our founding fathers forgot about when there were only six million of us back in 1800. And now with 320 million, it's a new level of governance in our society that is an entirely new um, uh, discipline, and we are just learning how to do it. It's also a recognition that how we build the built environment is a reflection of the underlying economy that in the industrial age, something you may not know, but that this, uh, this applied here in Europe uh, as it did in the US, that 40% of all jobs in the US, directly or indirectly, were related to the raw material going into the manufacturing of, the sales and distribution, the financing, the insurance, the building the roads for, and, and then fueling the automobile. There, there used to be a little jingo that, that the General uh, Motors had, which was, as you were seeing the USA in your Chevrolet, you could, you could have a little tagline, you're making yourself wealthier. Why we built what you all know as American uh, you know, strip, uh, a strip retail, strip commercial, and sprawl is because it made us wealthier. It put those 40% of of the workforce to work. So in the US, you may not believe it, but, but of course you saw Fred's slides of downtown Detroit. Now here's the city that, that was the second wealthiest city on the planet for 100 years. And it was because they built automobiles. And 100 years ago, that downtown was as vibrant as any other city in the US. Those pictures could have been replicated throughout the country. And this may, may surprise you, but the city in the U.S. that's best known for cars today, of course, is Los Angeles. Los Angeles, in 1945, had the longest rail transit system in the world. By 1962, it was all gone because of the automobile. So we used to build great walkable urbanism, but then over the last, you know, last half of the 20th century, we pushed the pendulum all the way over where we only built and massively subsidized and made legal. Only, the only way legal to build was the other alternative, drivable suburban. So you've seen this on the ground actually here in Europe as well. You know, the third beltway outside of Paris looks pretty much like the fourth beltway outside of Houston as far as how it lays out on, on the ground. But we started with subdivisions and we learned how to build freeways. Then of course, we invented the regional mall back in, in the late 1950s, early 1960s. And we got a lot better at building freeways. And naturally, it led to much further drivable suburban development. Now, we in the US have lots of land. Same with Canada, same with, you know, and same with Australia. 
we all stole the land fair and square, and we have a lot of it. So we would use it, throw it away, and keep on moving out. So in the late 20th century, for every 1% population growth, we had 6 to 8% land use consumption. But we had all this land, so we used it, and this is what we built. There was a lot of unintended consequences of this way of uh, developing. But the one that bothers me the most, of course, it happens to be the environmental. And that we now know that the built environment, real estate and the infrastructure, i.e. the transportation system in particular, is responsible for over 70% of greenhouse gas emissions. About 40% from our buildings, 30% from our cars. Here is Chicago. And in Chicago, you can see that, that the blue is downtown Chicago, which is by far the most walkable urban place in this region. The blue, each household emits 2.5 tons of CO2 per year. The red out on the drivable suburban fringe emits 12 tons of CO2 per year. So we now know that the number one cause of climate change from the US is the building of the drivable suburban fringe. Once we, we in this country get it through our thick heads that we, actually have to, uh, that we actually have to address this, how we build the built environment is probably gonna be the number one way that we will play in this game. In fact, I'll make the point in just one second that it is already showing up in the numbers. So now we're in the knowledge economy. The knowledge economy does not require the kind of car and truck trips. The, the, the software that, that's, that's powering this presentation, I got wirelessly. There was not a truck trip connected with it. And then on top of the, uh, of the knowledge economy is probably coming the experience economy. And the experience economy is to have primarily urban experiences. So both of these economies that are, layer, that are currently layering on top of the old agricultural and the old industrial economies are both driving us economically to build walkable urban places. So what we've seen since 1995 in our country is that the pendulum's beginning to swing back, demanding, the market is demanding more and more walkable urban places. We've seen many of our downtowns, most of our downtowns, our central cities, if you will, uh, come back. But we're also seeing an amazing urbanization of the rest of the, of the center city, but also the urbanization of the suburbs. That's the, really the big move that we're seeing in the US right now. The underlying consumer research backs it up. This is a colleague of mine at the University of Michigan looking at Atlanta and Boston, asking a series of very in-depth trade-off questions about, so what do you, where do you want to live in your next move? And long story short, 30-40% wanted to live in walkable urban places, 30-40% wanted to live in drivable suburban, and 30% could go either way. So in classic American 50-50 culture war kind of, uh, kind of dynamic, we, we have huge demand for walkable urban and very little supply. If you go to Boston, which is known as a pretty walkable place, if there's more than 20% of the built environment that is walkable, I'd be surprised. If you go to Atlanta, which is a very drivable place, if it's more than three or 4% walkable, I'd be shocked. So what do you have when you have pent up demand and low supply, you have price premiums. And what we're seeing today throughout the country, and we didn't see this 20 years ago, we're seeing 40 to 200% price premiums on a price per square foot basis, a price per square meter basis, than uh, the, uh, as, as far as walkable urban places over drivable suburban. And this is not just happening in the coastal cities like New York, like you just saw, and Washington and San Francisco and Portland. This is also happening in lowly places like Columbus, Ohio, which is not exactly you know, urbanism on steroids, but you're beginning to see lines cross as far as, um, here's one example, which is Worthington is their most expensive suburb, golf course community, gated golf course kind of place, versus a place called Short North. Short North is right next to downtown. 20 years ago was a slum. It was a very dangerous place. 
And if you were to buy in Worthington, you would have to pay 100% more on a price per square foot basis to buy in Worthington over Short North. Today, the lines have crossed. Worthington is the most expensive section of metropolitan Columbus as Worthington has gone down. We're seeing this throughout the country in every city where places that were slums have now become among the most, uh, among the most expensive in the entire country. The other thing which is really great about this is that it's, is that it's affected how we travel. Obviously, you know that the U.S. Is, you know, has been built around the car. And we also know that over the last 100 years, as we've seen growth in gross domestic product, GDP, it's been axiomatic that the amount we drive, as measured by vehicle miles traveled, VMT, would go up one to one. That if GDP went up 1%, that vehicle miles traveled would go up 1%. If GDP went down 1%, vehicle miles traveled would go down 1%. That's held for 100 years until the mid-90s. And all of a sudden, those lines are beginning to diverge. And it's flattening out. And in fact, what we now know is that vehicle miles traveled in the US peaked in 2004. In 2004, gas was $1.50 a gallon. And we had a pretty strong economy and we add about 1% to our population base per year. Yet it peaked in 2004. And even more surprisingly, and this is what's really driving this, is the young people. Those between 16 and 34, their driving peaked in 2001 when, when gas was a dollar per gallon. And it's dropped by 23% in absolute terms and 33% in per capita basis. From a social science point of view, that's falling off a cliff. As a result of that, the US, uh, that, that the US's emissions of CO2 peaked in 2007. It's now down to what it was in 1994 and continues to fall. Now, it's not entirely because of walkable urban development. Obviously, the slowing of the economy was certainly a part of it, and the shift to natural gas was a part of it. But a major reason for why the US is actually achieving the Kyoto Accords is because the young people leading the way are, are moving into walkable urban communities, and they're just not driving, and they're, and they're unintentionally sharing their heat with their upstairs neighbor. So this is how it's laying out in, in, in a Metro DC. I moved, my wife and I moved to Metro DC seven years ago because all my research kept on showing that DC was the model by which we're building the country. And it really is, is really playing out to be that way. I focus on where are the regionally significant walkable urban places, those places that are emerging as the great walkable places in the metro area. Turns out that there's 43 of them. And they start in the downtown. Then we have the downtown adjacent places. These are places immediately adjacent to downtown, small, uh, lower density, different character. They've all exploded. These together, given the fact that we have a height limit in DC, these areas that are about 12 different walkable urban places, what we're shorthand calling walk-ups, these places are going to be built out in 15 years. It's done. Downtown is 5% away from being built out. There were 90 surface parking lots in downtown when, when, uh, when a Rich Bradley took over downtown's management. Today, there are zero. Then there's the urban commercial districts that were local serving commercial districts. They've now come back as regionally significant urban entertainment zones and places for retailing. But then we go to the suburbs. This is the intriguing thing. Suburban town centers that were, that were swept up in the sprawl, they all went downhill back in the late 20th century, they're all coming back. A great grid of streets, historic buildings, they've come back tremendously. But here's the biggie, strip commercial. America's known for strip commercial. Well, we have 10,000 dead or dying malls in our country, and they're being converted into high-density, mixed-use, walkable urban places. And then finally, a few greenfield developments, places that you just add water and poof, instant urbanity. Um, this is not exactly the kind of places I like, but there is, a, there is a market for it. 
and 80% of these places are rail transit served. So here again are the six types of, of regionally significant places, the downtown, center city, downtown adjacent, urban commercial, but then again, the suburbs is really probably where 60% of the action is going in the US. The, all the suburban town centers that are converting, all the strip commercial that is being redeveloped, and then, and then the few green fields. Here's just one example, Arlington, Virginia, that if you want to understand the future of suburbia in the US, you must know Arlington, Virginia. This is Clarendon, one of one of the little downtowns of Arlington County. And this is what it looked like back in, in the 1980s. Sears had just moved out. And so on the left was the store, on the right was the garden center. Where this picture was being taken from was where they would work on your car. This is what it looks like today from the same perspective. Uh, it now has a Whole Foods organic grocery store, the Apple store is there, and above it are $500 per square foot condos. And yet two blocks on neither uh, north and south of here, it feathers back to single family. But that single family is the most expensive single family housing in the entire county. Why? Because they have the best of two worlds. They can live in suburbia and walk to 50 restaurants or walk to the metro, maybe even walk to work. And as a result, what we've seen is, is the tax base in Arlington, which in the 1980s, they have eight walkable urban places representing 10% of their land mass. In the 1980s, it represented 20% of their tax base and falling, for obvious reasons, look on the left. Today, that 10% represents 55% of their tax base and increasing. They now have some of the best schools in the nation, and it's a very diverse community. This is not a lily white place. Here's another example out in Denver. This is Via Italia, which is a regional mall that obviously the developer went to Italy and thought that if he added those little arches, it would be Italian. <laughs> um, obviously very successful. By the early part of the 21st century, it was vacant. It was dead. As a result, they bulldozed it and put in a grid of streets and put in a mixed-use development, retail on the ground floor, office, housing up above. It now gets 60% price premiums over the rest of the market and has put a foundation, a fiscal foundation, under its town. Now, we also know, recent research, that what happens when we move people from drivable suburban to walkable urban as far as, as, far as climate change and as far as CO2 uh, uh, emissions? Drivable suburban places on the left, you move somebody from there into a walkable urban place on the right, you cut their greenhouse gas emissions by 70 to 80 percent. Given that, as I mentioned earlier, that the built environment is responsible for 70 percent of CO2 emissions, building walkable urban places is, is in fact the number one way we're going to address climate change. And, and it doesn't come a moment too soon. Now, what about the economics? Does the market want this? Well, we took a look at this and uh, took a look at it in Metro DC as to what, what kind of price premium do you get for living or doing business in a walkable urban place? And we found that there are four levels of, uh, of economic performance. By the way, how many of you know what walk score is? So about a third of you. Walk score is a Seattle-based website. It's only in North America right now, but it's going to come to Europe soon. It's, it's on a scale of zero to 100. You put in your address or your neighborhood, any place in North America, and it'll tell you how walkable the place is instantly and free. If you're 5, 10, 20 walk score, you're very drivable. If you're 5 walk score, you need your car to go to the bathroom. <laughs> walkable places start at 70. And these walkable places, those 43 places I just showed you, that, oh, and by the way, those 43 places, I failed to mention, 43 places, they total 17,500 acres, and they are an average of 408 acres each. That 17,500 acres represents 0.91 of 1% of the total land in Metro Washington. 1%. In 
it is capturing 50% of all the buildings, all the square footage being built in this real estate cycle. And if you would add the local serving walk-ups, it would be 80%. What we've seen in the US is a fundamental shift from building drivable suburban to walkable urban. That's what the market wants. 80, maybe even 90% of future development will be in these walkable urban places. So how do they perform when they're walkable urban? Well, what we've learned is that every time you move from a copper to a silver to a gold to a, uh, to a platinum ranking from an economic point of view, on average, your walk score goes up by six points. So again, 70 to 76, 76 to 82. And what happens then is that your office rents go up by $7 per square foot per year. To translate that, that, that for every one walk score point, that the rent for an office space goes up seven euros per square meter per year. All that return goes right to your bottom line. There's no, ver there, there's no variable cost connected with it. That seven, that seven euro per, uh, per a square meter goes right into your pocketbook. Um, you're seeing the same with retail, rental apartment, and for sale housing for every, uh, for every step up, every six walk score points up, you're increasing the value of, of, of the average selling price for for sale housing by $113 per square foot. Translating, that's a, for every one walk score point, it is increasing the value of your home by 130 euros per square meter. These are huge jumps. The market is telling us, build more of this stuff. Now, besides looking at it from an economic point of view, we looked at it from a social equity point of view, defined as affordable housing and accessibility by all of us, not just the wealthy. And as you would expect, no surprise, as economic performance went up, social equity went down. That says that we've got a major challenge to address social equity as we build walkable urban places. Now, there's two reasons for this, and this, of course, is gentrification. That's what this is all about. And there's two basic reasons for, for gentrification. One is, is that it costs more to build urban product. It's just a better product. It costs more per square meter to construct high-density uh, product that's right up to the sidewalk that really has serious architecture. It's not just a spray-on facade. But the real reason is increased land values. And the reason it's increased land values is we don't have enough walkable urban land. As I mentioned, in the US, we have no shortage of land. We have a shortage of walkable urban land. That's what the folks in this audience are here to do. Create more walkable urban land to meet that huge pent-up pen demand for walkable urban places. To do that, we need place management. We know it's a three-legged stool as to how we make these places work. The, the public sector has a very important role to play to set the table. The private sector invests that 10 to $15 for every $1 of, of uh, public. But it comes down to the place management being key. Place strategy, place making, place management. 24-7 thinking about creating a great place. In essence, it's a missing level of governance in our society. That it's a, a level of governance that is below the city, below, in our country, the state, below the federal government. But it is a critical way of delivering the walkable urban that the market is demanding. And, and this place management needs to be much more expansive. We started place management as cost centers, as you know, providing clean and safe services. You get a budget, you spend your budget, you make it a little cleaner, you make it a, a little safer. We have to move it into more profit centers where you hold festivals and you begin to run the parking decks and you begin to run bus services and you make a little bit of money so you can plow it back in to the, into the center city. But then the real challenge is to turn them into investment centers where you're raising tens of millions of euros to invest in capital improvements in, in the center city, in the walkable urban place 
that will, that will both pay off the capital, but also make a profit. So here's one of the best examples in, in the US is Bryant Park, right near Times Square. This is Bryant Park 15 years ago. It was five acres. The city ran it for a budget of $250,000. For that, the city got the best drug dealing uh, park in all of New York. This is the, that if you wanted to score, you went to what was known as Needle Park. Very dangerous place, right behind the New York Public Library. This is what it looks like today. All done privately, 100% rebuilt with the private sector. And now the, the, the private sector based business improvement district told the city to keep your stinking $250,000, we'll raise it all the ongoing maintenance ourselves. It now has a budget of $8 million per year, 85% raised in the park. So it went from this concept of, of managing bureaucratically a, a park with a fixed budget to who couldn't make a lot of money if you have five acres at 42nd and Broadway. And it's a phenomenal story. Anytime you're in New York, you must see Bryant Park and just imagine what it was like 15 years ago. So I'd like to end with a, since I teach at George Washington University, I always have homework, I always have homework lists. So a couple to do to add to your very long list. First is recognize that, that, that the demand for walkable urban is gonna take a good generation to satisfy, certainly in the US. That 90% of the demand for real estate development is going to be on 10% of the land. We don't have to add one acre to the urban footprint in the US. We just have to redevelop 10% of the existing urbanized area. Number two is, is that we have to recognize the importance of placemaking as far as its role in preventing the greatest problem we have in our generation and possibly of all time, climate change. The other thing is to recognize that based upon my research, the best way to do this is through private-public partnerships. And I flipped that phrase intentionally. It goes back to that $10 private, $15 private for every $1 public. That, that if you're going to have the private sector invest that lopsidedly, you better have them involved with the leadership. These are private-public partnerships. And then push the envelope of what place management is. Again, it starts with clean and safe, it moves into managing festivals, but it must move much more rapidly into major capital investments in infrastructure and getting into becoming a catalytic development firm to assemble land, to then recycle it and get it back into the private market. And also though, it's up to the place manager to put in place the affordable housing strategy. These strategies must be conscious, they must be aggressive. And the other serious problem is that business improvement districts, which is what the US has tended to use, private sector led, private property paid for, it has this quaint little 18th century way of, uh, of voting where only private property owners get a vote. Kind of went out with the dodo. And it's going to be, we have a real legitimacy, we have a political legitimacy issue with this. So we must stay in front in giving the public real value and real public goods. And, but we really need to really push the fast forward button on putting in place this missing level of governance in our society, because that is the future. Place management is the future and we need to bring this much more to the fore than we have in the past. Thank you very much.